All right, we're going to tell you about the case study of Moldova because it is a terrible example of what happens when countries get caught up between their own loyalties. First, a little background. Where is Moldova? Well, right now, well, okay, still, Moldova is still <laughs> between... It didn't move? It didn't move overnight? <laughs> well, there are border disputes, uh, but... As we speak, Moldova is between Romania and Ukraine. Uh, Moldova is not in the European Union, but it has a treaty called the Moldova EU Association Agreement that establishes the political and economic uh, association. So for geopolitical sake, it is tied to the European Union. Therefore, it is suffering just as much as all other European countries, if not worse than its neighbors due to political actions that are tanking the economy. Now, Moldova was given a fast track application to the EU in June when it was announced that the Ukraine would that Ukraine would also get this fast track. So Moldova has a lot to prove to the EU right now. They're really watching them like, OK, we're going to give you this like kind of like I don't know how sororities and fraternities work, but I get the idea that like if someone gives you the opportunity to pledge, they watch to make sure that you're like kappa whatever material right, <laughs> right. this is right. how it is like they've been pledged now they have to go through the hazing well, kind well, what of are, and then what are some of the requirements right some of those requirements then are like hey you you know you you want to enforce russian sanctions yes you, you have to play by our rules so these are the pledging activities that right. are going on right now okay so that's why moldova has a lot to prove right now uh but where does moldova get most of its gas Hmm, uh, where everyone else gets their gas? Gazprom, you're oh, right. Russia. The Russian state energy company, Gazprom. Uh, the country is set to renegotiate debt payments with Gazprom by October 1st. And the prime minister does, in fact, feel that this needs to be done. Europe doesn't want her to, obviously, but she feels like she has to, even as she asks her citizens to sacrifice. So here is Natalia Gavrilita. She says, even if Gazprom continues the deliveries, we still have to reduce consumption. That means you and me, right? How much she's going to be doing, I don't know, but she wants her citizens to because the prices are very, very high, she said in this interview in Bucharest on Tuesday. She says the soaring prices are an anomaly for the summer, and we don't know how much they will continue to grow during the winter. I have an idea how much they're going to grow during the winter. Like this is, yes. oh, it's just the summer. It's, you know, you know, you because it's so hot out, you really want to heat your homes during the summer. So. Right. We're going to talk about the climate of like summer in the northern heaven sphere in, in a minute because they're assuming we don't know that summer is hot in the northern hemisphere um they have now the government is shooting for a 15 percent reduction in energy consumption how they're doing their part is that in the capital they've switched from gas to oil heaters um you know that helps only a little when inflation is currently at 30 percent 30 percent 30 percent oh, holy shit That's, yes you think your eight percent is bad or was right eight you percent know, in the u.s 30 percent well which also is probably an insight into how fake the u.s numbers actually are as we've said is probably right. double that anyway but anyway 30 percent holy smokes but moldova also has a russian controlled area inside their borders called transnistria I apologize if I mispronounce that. I've practiced many times today. The way it's spelled is Transnistria. Here's a map of the sliver along the border between uh, Moldova and Ukraine, which is uh, right now controlled by Russian military. Moldova does not re officially recognize this as a breakaway state, but they are saying that they're communicating with leaders there. This region does have its own president, its own government. Uh, the US, the EU, and NATO, of course, do not recognize it. They say, no, you're Moldova, and knock this off. Uh, but they operate independently. Now, the Prime Minister uh, Gravrilita that we just talked about, she said she is in talks with leaders in Transnistria, Transnistria because what she says, we want to keep peace and stability in the country. The worry is that Russia will defend that region just like it is defending the eastern borders of Ukraine. They obviously don't want that. They right. don't feel like they are game for that kind of conflict at all, especially while they're hurting from so much sanctions. Now, how are citizens of Moldova taking all of this political alliance with Europe? 
That's a question, right? I mean, protests, they ah. are protesting, uh, just like in the Czech Republic, just like in Austria and many other places, people are protesting. Uh, by many accounts, thousands came out this weekend and there's another planned for September 18th, I believe. I dare you to Google it because you do not find, at least if you're an English speaker. Now, I don't Google in Romanian. They speak a dialect of Romanian in Moldova, so I can't see that. But it is very hard if you are an English speaker to find evidence of this just using a search engine. Well, we saw that in Germany, right? The the German protests, in uh, th that was suppressed in the media. I mean, it was actually blocked on social media accounts, the protests in Berlin and yes. in Leipzig in, in Germany, um, coming out against the EU and against high gas prices. I guess it turns out like if if your government artificially does shit that makes it hard for your family to live, you don't like that. And you yeah. rise up and you tell them, you don't like that. I don't like having my gas. I have to switch to oil because of some ridiculous Russian sanction. Well, these protesters are specifically uh, protesting pro-NATO alliances, pro-EU alliances, and they want the resignation of President Maya Sandu, who is a pro-European politician who caused the country to have sort of a... Uh, reportedly, it, it her election pissed off Vladimir Putin because, um, you know, she is she is more aligned with the West. Now, again, we're asking for your cooperation. If you speak Romanian, um, please do send us information about these protests, because what we are able to see in the Western media is very, very little. Yeah. If you want to share, if you've got there, if you were at some of these protests, please send some videos to us. We'll share them here on the show. You can email them to me, Clayton at redacted.inc. Um, we will share them or here tag on the show. us on social media, yeah. anything like that. Um, meanwhile, the media is busy telling you that businesses are doing their part to reduce consumption of fossil fuels. But it's the households that really are the sort of wild card, right? So this Wall Street Journal article from today really pissed me right off. Um, look at the headline. It says, households a wild card as Europe moves to end Russian gas dependence. Oh, so it's, you, it's your personal house that we can't control. It's consumers. It's not businesses. Even though when it comes to carbon footprint and energy consumption and all things, you know, environmental... The data shows that you personally can't do shit, right? It's really businesses that make a big difference. But look at this headline. A painful push by businesses to cut their natural gas use is bringing Europe closer to its goal of weaning itself off Russian energy. Getting consumers to follow suit might prove more difficult. Because you know what? They're doing their part, but you just can't because you are a consumptive pig. Right, that's what they're telling us. They say this is this is crazy. I, I'm I just like I can't not have my mouth wide open. But I'm going to try and tell you it anyway. They say businesses have cut an average of 15 percent in energy costs since the war in Ukraine began. Only well down the article do they admit that the war started at the end of winter. So heating costs naturally will go down since the course of this war. Right? Oh, you mean when it's spring? <clears throat> so yes, they don't, they don't, they assume that you don't know that people don't use heating in the summer of the Northern Hemisphere, right? Like we're not talking about a war in June in Argentina where it is winter. Like here in the Northern Hemisphere, we haven't needed heaters right. since around March, April time, right? So, and okay, so here's what they say. In the first half of this year, total German gas use dropped about 15% annually, according to this association. Last winter's mild weather accounted for nearly half of that reduction, according to this group. Wait, wait, didn't you just tell me, though, that it's businesses that are making such strides? Now you're telling me it's really because the weather's been nice? Ah. That's some bullshit. Okay. So basically you're giving props to these businesses and they're not really doing shit. They're not doing anything, but they're saying you're not doing your part. Now they say in Munich, a similar reduction of 15% during this period is completely due to the temperature difference, said this spokesperson. So it's not like businesses are so pious and making all these big sacrifices and you just can't, you know, get in line. It's just that they didn't need their heaters in the summer. Right. Just like households didn't either. Um, and in Europe, we know that air conditioners are not nearly as common as they are in the West. So even though it was a hot summer, 
uh, air conditioners don't use gas. They are electric, right. right? So that wouldn't have factored into this. So sure, yes, we all should absolutely reduce, reuse, recycle, but I'm not buying that it has to be consumers. This article is total propaganda telling you that you're not doing your part because businesses have when the data does not support this. Um, well, again, when you look at Wall Street Journal owned by the Murdochs, yeah. right? I mean, again, follow, this is why we are, you know, we are independent on this show. Follow the money, follow the, ag the agenda of the publications and the news media. This yes. is, again, they are absolutely a part of the move towards a great reset and actually, and, and this climate initiative, um, members of the, the Murdoch family. So it's not surprising at all that this, and it's a very pro-business newspaper, of course. Wall Street Journal is like up the ass of, right. of businesses. So of so course don't they're buy for ass. one second that businesses are doing their part, but you're not. Like even the, if, if we go back to this article, this Wall Street Journal, you know, there's a picture here of a baker is, are they telling us that he's baking less, baking fewer rolls in order to help the war efforts? I don't understand. Or, it, yeah, he's, he's turning the lights off throughout the afternoon just to conserve because of, the, because of Putin's price hike. Like, I, I don't know. And, maybe, and, and so they want grandma to, you know, to sit under blankets at home like you're, you know, your, your German grandma has to sit under blankets at home and turn down the heat. And yes. if, if she even has heat, because there's, you know, they're not going to have gas even turned on. And if she's able to even find firewood, like where the hell are you going to get that at this point? It's her fault. It's grandma's fault. And the narrative that bothers me so much, it, I think it might not have if we had not just been through a pandemic where only, you know, we only individuals sacrificed to get us to the same goal where, you know, had we not made these sacrifices, we probably would be in the same spot in the yeah, pandemic. Like Target, right? Target, and Walmart. There was it wasn't sacrificing; it was record profits. But we were sacrificing on cheap energy. Now we're saying we must sacrifice on cheap energy. That hurts the elderly and the poor first, right? right? But we were told that we had to sacrifice our entire lives to help the elderly and the sick for two years. Right. But now we don't have to do that. We, we shouldn't, you know, the government won't front us on this one to keep our economies going in order to protect this population that we all just sacrificed for two years to protect. So I'm calling extreme bull crap on this narrative. Um, and apparently many others are too, and they are protesting. I'm going to well, find myself a protest to go to. Well, we're not, I mean, this isn't just well, Europe. I mean, California is the same thing. We're seeing this across the United States, right? Where you're being told, okay, we, we don't plug in your car in yeah. the, you know, in California, don't plug in your car because we're facing these blackouts because of our electricity. We cannot afford it. We can't do it right now. Please don't plug in your car and also don't drive a car. Don't buy gas. Don't own a car. Don't own a car. Don't buy a car. Don't plug in the, the electric car that we told you to buy. Don't do that either. Um, and then on top of that, grocery prices skyrocketing. Again, we're seeing the consumer price index come out overnight up to 8.3%. So again, you just thought, oh, prices are going to start to go down. No, no, sorry. Up higher, 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 higher. The value of a dollar right. going down, down, down. Well, at this point, it looks like at least in the United States, there will be a rail strike that was averted because the Labor Department seems to have negotiated with the unions um, and come to some type of agreement. We don't have that firmed up at this point, but if there had been a rail strike, those inflation numbers would be much, much worse. Um, and it would have been a bloodbath for Democrats. They really didn't want this going into the election. Yeah. So this was the White House this afternoon was quick to uh, quick to come out and say, hey, that's, you know, that's great news. We've averted this catastrophe. But again, to your point, they haven't written it down yet. We don't have an actual firmed up plan. But 57,000 railroad conductors um, are going to at least remain on the job. And that means the transportation of goods across the United States will not drive uh, numbers crazy. So good news on that front. Well, for, for, for me, that's, it's funny because like I, I look at this and I'm like, you know, if do you want a global revolution? Because this is how you get a global revolution. Yeah. And, and you actually like I, I saw an article, I think a couple weeks ago, uh, around about where uh, billionaires actually know this is coming. They know how like screwed the people are because of, of all of these backdoor deals and all of the like, you know, the corporations doing what they're doing, that billionaires are actually like building bunkers and hide and hiring private armies because they know this is coming. Oh, they geez. know that the, these, yes. that, that people will 
fight back. I'm glad you brought this up. In fact, there's a new book that I'm just about to read. Um, it's by Douglas Rushkoff. Um, he is a, an author. He was a tech writer and he actually has been invited to speak to these billionaires because he covers like um, uh, he, he covers like big changes in the tech world and like how this will affect um, how it will affect people. So he was invited out to speak to this group of billionaires who are actively building bunkers and they know. And, and he went out there to give the speech. He thought it was going to be like a speech in front of like a thousand people. And it was five people. It was five billionaires. They're like, here's your speech. They flew them out in this desert location and they went into this room and they're like all actively, they're like, how do we protect ourselves? What happens when the, do when the dollar collapses? How do we pay our group of Navy SEALs that we've hired to protect our, our staff and our families? Like they hire Navy SEALs. They hire special forces people to protect themselves. That's in these crazy. Bunkers. Um, Peter Thiel building a bunker in New Zealand just built, you know, um, so all of these guys are actively doing this stuff because they know shit's about to hit the fan. Yeah. Crazy, crazy. I'll, I'll find that name. Rushkoff. Douglas Rushkoff is the, the author and uh, he has a new book that I'm going to actually it's on my list to, to read called Survival of the Richest. Um, so it's a, a new book that I'm about to check out and read.